Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Good evening. Um, I am Teresa Blondin, the Manager of Volunteers and Community Programs for Bladder Cancer Canada. We're so happy to have you all here today. Um, first, I'll introduce my colleague on the session with us today, Shasta Basha. She's our National Fund Development Manager. Um, and part of Bladder Cancer Canada's mission is to provide education to our community. And there's some really special things about Carcinoma Institute that makes it worthwhile uh, to have a dedicated session just on this. So now I would like to introduce our presenter for the evening, Dr. Peter Black. He's an active member of the Bladder Cancer Canada community as the chair of our medical advisory board. He's also a urological oncologist at Vancouver General Hospital, a research scientist at Vancouver Prostate Center, and a professor in the Department of Urologic Sciences at the University of British Columbia. He specializes in urologic cancers, especially bladder and prostate. So we are so happy you're here tonight and welcome Dr. Black. Thank you, Teresa and Shasa. Shasa, um, real pleasure uh, to, to be here and, and uh, speak with hopefully a, a big audience from across the country. Um, always love talking to patients about uh, important issues uh, in bladder cancer. I see there are a couple of my own patients out there who always ask the super difficult questions. So I, I will look forward to the uh, discussion at the end. Please, uh, please do ask uh, questions. But I'll get right into it. I'm going to share my screen. The topic is carcinoma in situ. Now, I remember when I was a resident, which uh, seems not that long ago, but it actually is. Um, and, you know, with an MD under my belt wanting to become a urologist, I didn't really understand carcinoma in situ. It's not completely straightforward. Um, and I think it really is worthy of some attention. It's also um, has become more and more important uh, over the past few years because it's really important for clinical trial design. And a lot of the new treatments for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer are being tested in patients with carcinoma in situ. So I'd like to highlight a little bit why that is. Um, but we'll start with the basics. So let me just so you'll, you'll be familiar with this spectrum of bladder cancer from Non-muscle invasive on the left, so about three quarters of patients have non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, and about a quarter have muscle invasive bladder cancer at the time of diagnosis. Um, so that that part is well known to you. And and today we're talking about non-muscle invasive disease over on the left hand side. And what makes carcinoma situ or this TIS or CIS carcinoma situ? Um, what makes it special is it's flat, so it does not form an actual tumor, a three-dimensional tumor. We, we refer to these tumors as papillary because they have finger-like extensions. So it is non-papillary and flat, yet it has the potential to turn into any one of these things over here. Uh, so in situ means that it is not yet moved beyond the surface of the bladder, um, but it is still cancer. It's carcinoma but it has not gone uh, beyond the, uh, the sort of boundary of the inner lining of the bladder. And so if we think about how bladder cancer is classified, we have the non-invasive ones, we have the ones that are invasive into the first layer of the bladder and those that are invasive into muscle. So that's how we classified it. And within the non-invasive, we have the flat ones, which are the carcinoma in situ, and then we have the papillary ones with the, the three, three dimensional finger-like projections. And they can be low grade. Most of them are low grade and relatively harmless. Some of them can be high grade and of course are at higher risk of turning into something more threatening. Um, one important feature of carcinoma in situ is that it's always high grade. So this is what it might look like under the microscope. Just microscope just to give you an impression. I don't expect you to to have a lot of background in uh, microscopy, but uh, this on the left here is what the normal bladder urothelium looks like. So the inner lining of the bladder is, is called urothelium. And this is the actual uh, urothelial layer and underneath it is connective tissue. And you can see it's actually quite well organized. Um, we talk about a basal layer at the bottom here and then different layers, intermediate layers. And at the top, we talk about an umbrella layer because it's that's the barrier to the, the urine and, and everything uh, potentially toxic in the urine that protects the lining of the bladder. And then you see here, um, carcinoma in situ. So it doesn't look a lot different. It's, it's, it's still flat. You can see there's no real tumor formation 
but it's it's a little bit chaotic and disorganized and you can see that the superficial layer is uh, starting to shed so so ce cells are potentially shedding into the urine and we're missing this well-defined umbrella layer at the top these flat lesions differ from the papillary lesions where you can see these finger-like projections and this um this sort of the bulk of the tumor sticking up into the into the lumen of the bladder And so just to reiterate some of these points, you know, what is carcinoma in situ? It's flat, so there's no tumor extending into the lumen of the bladder. Uh, it may appear as a red patch when we look uh, by cystoscopy, but it can also be invisible. So we don't necessarily see it. And that, of course, makes it a little bit tricky. It's definitely an early stage of bladder cancer, but because it's, at, because it's high grade, it's at risk for uh, progressing into a higher stage. So you'll, you'll know that stage describes the extent of a cancer and grade describes uh, how aggressive it looks under the microscope. So it's potentially aggressive, but it's very early. Uh, so it has potential to develop in the muscle invasive bladder cancer. I've said that a few times already. And what makes it really tricky, other than the fact that it can be invisible, is that this transition from something non-invasive to invasive is very unpredictable. And we would like to think that if we follow a patient closely, we will see some sign of worsening before it is actually a problem, but that is often not the case. We will often follow a patient closely, and then all of a sudden, the patient has a muscle invasive tumor, maybe even spread to lymph nodes or something else. And that means that we've already um, you know, compromised outcome in that patient. The outcome will not be as good as if we had done something sooner. Some additional special features of carcinoma in situ. Uh, if, so it, it can occur together with papillary tumors, uh, so the TA and T1 tumors. And if it does occur together with those tumors, there's a higher rate of recurrence, so the cancer can come back after treatment, and a higher rate of progression, meaning it can, it can turn into a higher stage, a muscle invasive tumor. So it's a bit of a um, a biomarker and in that regard, it stratifies the risk of patients with, with the other types of tumors. We, we consider it, we, we um, think that it is always present in multiple locations. I think that this, there's some controversy around this, but the assumption is that if you have it in one spot, you have it in other spots. And I think this may depend a little bit. I think there are patients with papillary tumors and just a little bit of CIS right on the on the shoulder of the papillary tumor where there's probably nothing anywhere else in the bladder. That might be different than the patient who has patchy carcinoma in situ everywhere in the bladder. Because it's potentially invisible and potentially multifocal, we think that we cannot resect it completely with transurethral bladder tumor resection. This is an important difference to papillary tumors where we typically try to remove everything when we do the TRBT. Um, and so if we're putting drugs into the bladder, such as um, BCG, um, we're, we're expecting the BCG to actually get rid of the cancer cells, so to get rid of the carcinoma in situ. Otherwise, if you have a, a papillary tumor, we're expecting the BCG to prevent recurrence, but not necessarily get rid of something. So there's a difference there between prevention and eradication. Um, and that's, that's what's important, important in clinical trials, as I'll come back to. Um, so this is just an example of how you can get both in one tumor. So this is when we're, when we're doing the TRBT, where we're scraping off the tumor in, in pieces, in um, chips, we refer to these as. You can see this, this is maybe neighboring chips or one chip, and on this part, you have papillary tumors. So again, the, the finger-like projections. And on this part, you have a flat area of carcinoma in situ. And so this has a, um, a higher risk of recurrence and progression than if it was just the papillary tumor by itself. So carcinoma in situ by itself is relatively rare. If, if you see a lot of bladder cancer like I do, you see it quite frequently, but, but overall it's, it's a small minority of all new bladder cancer patients. Um, instead, as I said, it's usually together with uh, papillary bladder cancer. And, and so we describe primary CIS uh, 
and uh, secondary CIS. And primary is where it's just found by itself without anything else. And secondary means it's found with a papillary tumor or after a patient has a prior history of papillary tumor. Um, it's important to recognize that carcinoma in situ can also be found in the urethra, uh, especially in, in men in the prostatic urethra. And, and in the prostatic urethra, it can also extend along the, the channels that go into the prostate, so the prostate prostatic ducts. And it can also be present in the ureters all the way up into the lining of the kidney, the renal pelvis. So we consider that that entire lining, that's the urethelium. And anywhere in the urethelium, you can have carcinoma in situ. Of course, it is most common in the bladder. And so let me um, introduce a patient profile to you and we'll, we'll go over the management and the diagnosis and management uh, with this patient as an example. So uh, 87 year old gentleman, uh, he's a retired chartered accountant. He smoked uh, for a long time, but uh, quit a few years ago. He was found on just a routine health check to have microscopic hematuria. So blood in the urine visible under the microscope, but not to the naked eye. He's never had visible blood. You can debate on the merits of doing this kind of routine urine analysis. I don't want to get into that, but this patient had it and there was blood and he was uh, referred for evaluation. Now, he also had some uh, some, some voiding symptoms. So some issues urinating, he had a weak stream. He was getting up two to three times per night and he had some urgency. So he knew where all the bathrooms were when he went out in case he needed one. And we'd say that these symptoms maybe are, are typical for an 87 year old. They wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, garner special attention. Uh, but they, you know, something like urgency also catches our attention was, well, is, is there something else going on in the bladder? Now he does have significant medical issues and this is important for the treatment, um, especially if we start talking about uh, removing the bladder at any point. So he had some heart disease, had some diabetes, high blood pressure. And most importantly, as a longtime smoker, uh, he also had emphysema and was on um, oxygen uh, at home. Uh, especially if he did any activity, he needed uh, a little bit of oxygen to to um, to breathe easily. Now, before he was referred for evaluation to the urologist, he had a urine test, a urine cytology done. And I think you'll all recognize urine cytology is different from the usual urinalysis. Um, in this case, uh, ideally, the urine sample is is delivered fresh, meaning you you pee <laughs> into the container in the lab, and a preservative is immediately put into it, um, and then it's it's centrifuge down so you only get the sediment, and then a pathologist, so a cytopathologist, a, you know, a specialist for looking at this type of thing, actually looks at the cells under the microscope and is trying to determine if there are any cancer cells there or not. So quite different than the typical urine test, but something that should be done routinely in patients uh, with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and also in patients being evaluated for hematuria, uh, not, not in all, but in this patient, it was certainly um, indicated. So now we look at cytology, and this is maybe getting a little bit too, in, too much into the weeds here, but we use what we call the para system to define cytology. I think this is important because the terminology I think can be a little bit uh, confusing for a patient, and it, but it means something very specific to us. So we're really focused on the on the middle four categories. I mean, the often the specimen is inadequate, uh, meaning the cells are are degenerated is a word we like to use, just uninterpretable because the specimen's old or wasn't uh, the preservative wasn't added on time or whatever it might be. And down at the bottom, low grade, we're not, we're not doing this test to look for low grades. So this essentially is, is a non-entity and I can't remember ever finding anything else in the urine, but theoretically it's possible. So we're really looking at these four. And so a urine cytology, and this is true for any patient, in, independent of, of carcinoma in situ, it's either negative, meaning there's nothing, nothing wrong, no abnormal cells found. There are cells, but just no cancer cells. It can be atypical. It can be suspicious or it can be high-grade cancer. And 
Atypical is very common and we typically consider it to be negative. So we don't usually evaluate atypical. We may repeat the cytology and really try to optimize the conditions. We'll make sure there's no infection. Uh, atypical is seen frequently in patients who've had a cystectomy and have a urinary diversion, whether it's urostomy or a neobladder, whatever it might be. Um, the urine sitting in the bowel can make it atypical. But what we're looking for is suspicious for high grade or actually high grade. And those, these patients will always warrant further evaluation. The, this is just a picture that shows you these, you know, the pathologists sometimes don't have much to work with. So I think it's also important to recognize that they're often uh, really just, you know, trying to assess something based on, on uh, you know, 10 to 20 cells, that kind of uh, number. Specifically for carcinoma in situ, since I showed you the pictures where, where it's shedding cancer cells, it is often positive. The urine cytology is often positive in patients with carcinoma in situ, but not always. So it's not, it's not truly definitive. If we look at other high-grade tumors, um, the rate drops off a little bit compared to carcinoma in situ. If we look at low-grade tumors, then I would say urine cytology is of very little value because um, really it's defined by high grade. So we don't typically do it for low-grade tumors unless it's a recurrent low-grade tumor and we want to rule out high-grade disease. But the the sensitivity, so if, if, a, um, if a patient um, has a tumor, only between 15 and 55% will be detected by cytology. So it's, it has a very poor sensitivity, of course, because it's missing all the low-grade tumors. But if the cytology is positive, so if they're suspicious or high-grade cells, then almost all of those patients will have cancer. So it's a high specificity. So we take a positive cytology very seriously. A negative cytology, we can't be sure that there's nothing there. But if there are suspicious or high-grade cells, we take that very seriously and we evaluate it further. And of course, it's, it's frequent with CIS. And, and it's port, important for diagnosing CIS. And here again is an example, just how the cells are being shed. So the, the abnormal uh, carcinoma in situ layer is, is basically just uh, peeling off. We talk about it being denuded. Um, the pathologists use that term a lot, but the cells just break off into the urine and it makes the urine cytology a valuable test. So if we think back to our patient now, who's referred, uh, let's say to me <laughs> as a urologist and has the microhematuria, long time smoker, an elderly male put, puts him at risk. And then he has a positive cytology. So I'm thinking um, before I've even seen the patient, he has urothelial carcinoma and I have to find it. So he certainly warrants a CT of the kidneys and ureters. So CT IVP, intravenous pyelogram is IVP. And in this case, it was normal. So there was no suspicion of anything uh, in the kidneys or ureters. And then of course, I perform cystoscopy to evaluate the bladder. This, the CT scan is inadequate to tell me what's going on in the lining of the bladder. But I, um, in the bladder, I saw a raised red patch on the back wall of the bladder. And so of course the next step is to take this patient to the operating room and to do a biopsy of that red patch to see if it is bladder tumor. And at the time of cystoscopy, there are a couple of tools that um, we might be able to use. One of them is uh, CISU. So CISU is the trade name for the substance that's put in the bladder but we tend to refer to it more commonly as blue light cystoscopy or fluorescent cystoscopy. And you may have heard of this. This is a uh, patient is, it, it's done, especially in, in Canada only in patients coming into the operating room for suspected bladder tumor. We put a catheter into the bladder, put the, the, the reagent, the cisview into the bladder for, for one hour, at least one hour. And then the patient rolls into the operating room and has the procedure done with both the normal light, which is white light, and then the blue light or fluorescent light. And the cancer cells um, will, will take up the cysts from the urine, the normal cells do as well, but they have some metabolic abnormalities that will allow them to accumulate a fluorescent uh, metabolite 
So when you switch from the white light to the blue light, it really lights up as this bright pink. And it's it's super easy to use. It's 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 very intuitive. It's very you know black and white so to speak. So pink and blue, pink and blue, um, and and it really helps detect uh, additional disease. About twenty percent of patients will have something additional detected by the blue light cystoscopy, which means in eighty percent of cases it doesn't add anything. But that's okay. Overall, we know we're going to detect more and we're going to have better outcomes if we use it, even though it's only helping 20% of patients. Downside, of course, is cost, but otherwise there's little, little downside from a, a patient's perspective. Um, the alternative is narrowband imaging. This, uh, for the uh, experts in the audience, this is actually in the kidney and not in the bladder, but it actually just is based on filters. So blue and green filters that will accentuate the blood vessels in a tumor and help delineate what is tumor versus normal. It is a simple switch of a, a flip of a switch rather, sorry, um, to go from just regular white light to, to employ these filters. And so it's available on a lot of scopes and the urologist may or may not use it. It, hasn't, it doesn't have the same level of evidence. So the trials haven't really been as definitive in showing a benefit for narrowband imaging, but it's certainly something to, to consider. Now, the fluorescence cystoscopy, I think it, it required, there's a lot of confusion I see it on a daily basis about how we can use fluorescence cystoscopy. So in principle, you could use it in a patient who's had a prior bladder tumor and is coming in for surveillance, just the right routine cystoscopy, and, and you could put the same cystview in the bladder beforehand and use the fluorescent cystoscopy to, to increase detection of recurrences. Um, and so this would be done in patients with a history of intermediate or high risk bladder cancer. I won't get into the, how exactly we define this, but, but basically for sure, any patient who's had a high grade tumor or has had carcinoma inside you, in principle, you could use this to uh, better find recurrences. In practice in Canada, you cannot. Uh, it is not approved for this indication in Canada. Um, the equipment is actually not available in Canada. The CISFI, of course, is available. And you know, if you had the equipment, you could potentially use it even off label, but it is not approved. It's not available. It is not used. Um, it is, it is also potentially very, very expensive to use it all the time. So that would be a little bit problematic. So you cannot ask your urologist or your GP, for example, for a referral to see somebody who's going to do CISVIEW for surveillance. I think that's very important. I get a lot of queries. Instead, the CISVIEW is only used in a patient who has a suspected bladder tumor and is going to the operating room for resection. And it's used at the time of resection to make sure that we see as much as possible and remove as much as possible, which will improve the recurrence-free survival. So the rate of recurrence will decrease. And there's very good evidence to, to support that. So if we go back to our 87-year-old chartered accountant, um, he had his uh, resection or his, his biopsy performed uh, with the blue light cystoscopy, had a spinal anesthetic for this. Um, the red patch that we saw on white light cystoscopy was, a visible, was visible again, and it lit up on fluorescence. Now that's a, a sign that it's more likely cancer, but even inflammation can light up. So that doesn't tell us for sure. But there's also a second patch that lit up um, on, on the uh, blue light that was not seen on the white light. And you get an idea, this isn't actually from the patient, this is something, uh, you know, a stock photo, but you can see here how this looks pretty normal. If, if you can't see it, you can take my word for it. <laughs> and then here, it really lights up clearly, um, very distinct from, from the regular background. Uh, so this was all resected. Um, and you can tell how, you know, I, I said at the beginning that carcinoma in situ cannot, you know, we, we're probably not seeing it all and we're probably not resecting it all. But with the cis view, it really raises the question, are we now actually seeing it all? And can we now actually resect it all? That's an open question. Most patients, by the way, if, if, you, if you look at the literature uh, with cis view, most patients will have two or three lesions. Most patients with carcinoma in situ will have two or three lesions 
and and very few have more than that. So it does raise the possibility that you could resect it all. Our patient biopsy shows this. Again, um, you're all becoming experts now in recognizing carcinoma in situ under the microscope. Uh, so just the surface layers, but completely chaotic and rather angry looking. No invasion into the deeper layers. So how do we treat this? Again, we cannot completely resect it. So surgery is, is really just for diagnosis. And then we need intravesical therapy, in this case, BCG, to eradicate it. And for all carcinoma in situ, again, it's, it's high-risk disease. It should be induction, so once a week for six weeks, followed by maintenance BCG up to 36 months. So it's a full three-year course, 27 doses of BCG. That's um, optimal treatment, and anything less is suboptimal treatment. Um, now, this 36 months was originally quite arbitrary. Uh, it was just, you know, let's do it this way. But there has uh, have since been trials that have compared three years to one year and a full dose to one third dose. And the trials show that three years full dose is the way to go. So we really stick to that. It's effective treatment. And that's what we want to deliver. We think that the maintenance is especially important for carcinoma in situ, since we're not surgically eradicating it. Um, we need the maintenance to, to keep it away once we have eradicated it. Really important. Um, again, it's, it's the nitty gritty of the disease, but it's so important in individual patients that there can be a delayed response. So if you give the first six doses of BCG, only 55% will have cleared the CIS at three months when you reevaluate. But if you give another course of BCG, just another three doses, the first maintenance round, then 80% will be clear at six months. So you can see the, the danger is to tell a patient after three months, oh, the BCG didn't work, BCG did not work, we need to do something else or we need to remove your bladder. That would, um, would deprive patients of effective treatment in many cases. Um, and, and there's very little risk of progression to something more threatening in the short term uh, with CIS. We've also learned uh, the hard way, uh, well, sort of the hard way, but there was a, a very nice trial done in Germany, the Nimbus trial just a couple of years ago was, came out during, during COVID um, that tried to reduce the number of doses given. Um, and it showed that that was clearly inferior, remarkably inferior to the regular uh, dosing schedule. So even though the first schedule chosen was fairly arbitrary, we have good evidence to support it, that it should be given uh, as per the guidelines. Of course, side effects are important. Um, I wouldn't, uh, don't wanna downplay the side effects uh, with BCG, but typically if, if managed, carefully by, by those who do a lot of it, um, most patients will make it through treatment and will not have to stop due to side effects. And when I say most, um, it's in the order of 75 to 90% who do not stop. So, so the, some will stop, of course, for recurrence, but those who do not stop for recurrence, somewhere between 75 and 90% will actually complete the full three years. Now, if a patient cannot get BCG for the carcinoma in situ, uh, we really do not have a good second choice. And this is, is a, an unmet need for sure in our, our care of patients with bladder cancer. So a patient could, for example, have had a kidney transplant before and they're on medications to suppress the immune system. And then you cannot give a drug that works by activating the immune system. First of all, it's unlikely to work if you're suppressing the immune system. And second of all, it may lead to a BCG uh, infection, which could be dangerous. Now, we do on occasion use it anyway. There are small reports that it's, that it's um, safe in kidney transplant patients, but we don't really know if it works. So um, the other issue are those who really can't tolerate BCG. So those who do have significant side effects. And, and this, you know, without doubt happens. I, for example, have a handful of patients who've developed um, a reactive arthritis. So, so severe inflammation in a, in a joint that causes significant pain. And we cannot just go back and give those patients more BCG. 
So those patients are referred to as BCG intolerant. Um, in a lot of places, not so much in BC, um, not so much in Canada compared to elsewhere, but certainly in the US, there are a lot of issues with BCG shortages. So patient may be eligible, patient may tolerate it, but there's no BCG to give. So for these patients, there is no clear established second option, uh, you know, alternative uh, treatment. We, um, we meaning the bladder cancer uh, sort of research community has adopted the combination of gemcitabine and docetaxel, so two chemotherapy agents um, as the, the go-to alternative based on some, you know, some good results in the literature, but actually not the highest level of evidence. So not necessarily high quality clinical trials. Um, so that all stands a little bit on shaky grounds. It's actually also difficult to administer wherever you are in the country. Um, the, uh, it's rel relatively resource intense and a lot of places simply don't offer it. The, there's, you know, the nursing support is not provided and the urologist doesn't necessarily have the uh, capacity to spend two and a half hours delivering this combination chemotherapy. So that, that again is a real issue that we need to address. Often um, in places that, that can't do the combination, the patient will get a single agent uh, chemotherapy. So maybe gemcitabine is given popularly, popularly or mitomycin, um, but the effectiveness is really not very good. They, they do not work specifically in carcinoma in situ. And of course, the only good alternative is uh, cystectomy. Often we would try a round of single agent chemotherapy before proceeding to cystectomy, however. So in this, I think you're familiar with, uh, BCG is given, you know, you have the surgery or the biopsy. Whoops, sorry, this is chemo. Uh, it's given once a week for six weeks and then monthly up to a year. BCG is given once a week for six weeks and then once a week for three weeks at three months, six months, and every six months up to three years. A lot of clinical trials uh, going on, trying to improve first-line therapy. Here are just some uh, examples. So there are different strains of BCG that may or may not make a difference. And so there's a big trial in the US, um, this S1602 that has completed, um, it was a 900 patient trial. So a really big trial is gonna be a lot of new information, be very valuable. Um, it won't report until I think at least 2024 but it will tell us if the Tokyo strain is as good or maybe better than the currently established TICE strain. And it'll also tell us if a vaccination in the skin given before the BCG starts will improve outcomes. So those are two uh, very, very easy, simple questions to ask that could, could improve treatment and broaden our, our um, availability of, uh, of BCG. Um, on the, I'd say on the other end of complexity are, are these three trials. There's so three different trials have the same design as I've shown here. Uh, basically any patient with high risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer who would otherwise get BCG can get BCG standard of care versus BCG plus immunotherapy um, versus BCG where you only get the first six doses without the, without the maintenance plus the immunotherapy. And so it's, it's intensifying the BCG with immunotherapy to try and improve both the response rate and the durability of response. Now, I would say that BCG works so well, this can be hard to show a benefit, but three different trials um, have completed and we're waiting for those to report out also in the next couple of years. Uh, another interesting one, which um, is likely to roll out in Canada in the not too distant future, is a genetically engineered BCG that um, has been modified to make it both more tolerable, but also more effective. So stay tuned for that. And then there's a big trial rolling out in the US and maybe some Canadian centers that is comparing this combination chemotherapy versus BCG in the first line setting to actually, again, a very simple question, but we, we need that evidence. Can we replace BCG with chemotherapy especially in patients who cannot get BCG or if there's no access. So um, all exciting trials.
So now if we go back to our patient, so our 87 year old had carcinoma in side two, he gets um, BCG, first typical sort of side effect profile, he gets the first three doses without much side effects, but then with those four, five, and six, he has increased frequency, urgency, and dysuria, so urethral burning. Um, but it typically resolves within a day or two and doesn't require any, any drugs. He also, I think a lot of patients notice just some general uh, uh, systemic symptoms, so fatigue, and they just feel lousy for a day or two, but then he would bounce back. And, uh, and by the time I see him for his three months cystoscopy, which is about four to six weeks after finishing the BCG, uh, his bladder function is good. And so how do we follow patients with BCG? Uh, it's the same, I mean, sorry, with CIS. The follow-up is the same with CIS as it is for any high-grade um, non-muscle invasive bladder tumor, which means we do the urine cytology and cystoscopy every three months for two years, then every six months for the following two years, and then annually, the recommendation is lifelong. I typically say lifelong or until the patient gets tired of it, just doesn't want to do it anymore. Uh, but there is a risk of recurrence uh, for that patient at any point in the future. If, if we had access to the flexible fluorescent cystoscopy, we would do it every six months for the first two years. But again, we do not have access to that. That's in the US only. We also have to remind ourselves that, that that these uh, tumors can form in the kidneys and ureters. And so typically we have a CT IVP when we start, we repeat it a year later, and then every other year for at least a few years in patients with um, high risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And follow-up is not always easy once you have something like this and once you've had BCG. For example, we see a lot of on, on follow-up cystoscopy, we will see a lot of areas that look inflamed, they may look red, and it's impossible to tell just looking at it, is it inflammation, is it just residual from treatment, or is it actually cancer? Similarly, on a CAT scan, this, this CAT scan here shows, if, if you know what to look for, that the bladder wall is quite thickened. And so radiologists love to write in their reports, um, you know, bladder wall thickening consistent with known bladder cancer as if patients still had bladder cancer, but the bladder cancer has been completely treated and is not there. And that's just a residual thickness that, that is, is equivalent to scarring or inflammation. So that's really of no concern, but it often leads to a lot of confusion. And similarly, atypical cytology, once you have a lot of inflammation in the bladder, uh, the cytology is often atypical and then the, you know, the question comes up, well, what does that mean? And my answer is nothing, um, but it still always, uh, always leads to confusion. So our patient um, had the three months of BCG we talked about, and his cytology remained positive for cancer cells. So no, un unequivocally, this patient still has cancer, um, you know, with, with near 100% certainty. Uh, we did cystoscopy and the bladder looked inflamed, uh, you know, it was just treated with BCG, but no tumor, nothing suspicious, nothing really to do anything about. And so we don't let ourselves be bothered by the cytology. We, we had a CAT scan at baseline. So we, we know that the kidneys are okay. The bladder looks fine. This is likely persistent carcinoma in situ. We don't need to biopsy it to show that we need to continue with the BCG and then reevaluate at the six month time point. So three months later. Um, so now some would say, okay, the, the cytology is positive. Let's biopsy, let's show that there's cancer there and let's repeat the induction BCG times six. And I'd say it's controversial and, and um, you know, this not necessarily, not necessarily wrong, but there's a risk of over treating with BCG of overwhelming the immune system to actually lead to suppression of the immune response. Now at the six month time point, th this is when we really have to decide, okay, decide has the BCG worked? Do we continue with BCG or do we need to switch to something else? I for one will automatically biopsy all of these patients at six months, but I'm in a small minority there. Most patients will only biopsy if, if there's something abnormal. Uh, the problems are that uh, the bladder often looks abnormal regardless. Um, there are areas 
of of inflammation that could be cancer and um and, and then the other thing is it's carcinoma sites you can be invisible so if you're if you're basing everything off appearance you might miss something and so our patient had the normal cystoscopy but a suspicious cytology so what do we do with that so if we have a positive cytology but don't see anything on cystoscopy there's a there's sort of a standard protocol that that kicks in um, so we need to take the patient to the operating room we need to get urine from each ureter renal pelvis so right side left side send that off because these these cancer cells could be coming from further upstream or they could be coming from the bladder if available we would then like to do fluorescent cystoscopy um, to see if anything lights up that we can biopsy specifically if that's not available or even in addition to that we will do what we call mapping biopsies which is supposed to be shown on this side here, for example, one from the right wall, one from the left wall, one from the back, one from the dome, one from the bladder floor, whatever, whatever the map might be. And we need to think of the prostatic urethra in the male, and we would do a biopsy of that as well. And so if we do all of this, we're likely, very likely to find out where the cancer cells are coming from. And so our gentleman, uh, had a repeat fluorescent cystoscopy. Now you have to be careful because BCG can lead to false positives. So you can get inflammation that looks suspicious on the fluorescent cystoscopy. Um, and it's not officially approved within 12 weeks of last dose of BCG. Um, but anyway, he had fluorescent cystoscopy. There were no lesions identified. He had urine taken from the right kidney and the left kidney. It was clear. He had biopsies taken from prostatic urethra that were clear, but in two of five of the random biopsies in the bladder, there's carcinoma in situ. So he's had induction and one round of maintenance BCG, and he still has carcinoma in situ. And this is defined, this meets definition of BCG in response of carcinoma in situ. And so patient's exposure to BCG determines what we do next. And, and so this patient meets the criteria of BCG unresponsive. He's had optimal BCG and still has high grade disease. There are some patients who've had less than, than uh, that BCG or they had that BCG and they did fine for a while and then they recur, they are BCG exposed. The first time patient is BCG naive and we talked about BCG intolerant. And it depends which one of these categories a patient falls into how they are treated next. And so for BCG unresponsive, very specifically, these are the patients where BCG really has no further role. They, you know, they've had the best we can hope for and it didn't work and we need to move on to something else. So standard of care is clearly radical cystectomy, uh, removal of the bladder, but this will be over treatment in many patients. Many patients will not be medically or, or physically fit for surgery. Many patients will prefer to try something else before moving on to cystectomy. I mentioned that gemcitamine docetaxel has become the de facto standard for those who have access to it, which again is not universal, um, but it, it is a promising and inexpensive and easy, it's not easy, it's resource intense, but, but it doesn't require any, require any special equipment or anything. Um, there are a couple of drugs, pembrolizumab is one of these new immunotherapies, valrubicin is a, an older drug that's approved in the US, but not even available in Canada that doesn't work very well. Um, or single agent chemotherapy. These are available. Now the immunotherapy, pembrolizumab, has been approved in Canada in this setting based on one clinical trial, but it's not covered and it's extraordinarily expensive. So I've never had a patient um, go for that, but it is an option. And then ideally patients would go on clinical trials and, and we and others have, have clinical trials going on in this space. So our patient ends up getting gemcitamine and docetaxel. Um, he has carcinoma in situ here. We can expect 50% recurrence-free survival out to two years. So at least 50% of patients, we're still going to be talking about removing the bladder, or, or we will be talking maybe for the first time about removing the bladder um, after the, the gem dosi. Um, and we have to be careful. I generally think that it's reasonable for CIS or a high-grade TA tumor to try an additional round of treatment before cystectomy, but we have to be careful about more and more rounds, which lead to a higher and higher risk of progression to muscle invasive bladder cancer. 
Um, I'm going to skip over that for the sake of time. There's a lot going on in the clinical trial world. And again, it's all focused on carcinoma in situ. They have some of the worst names you can imagine for drugs, but some of them are super exciting. This one here, this uh, which actually goes by the term N803, I think is one to look out for because it, it is definitely the best new drug out there from a, from a clinical trial results point of view. And hopefully we'll have it hopefully it'll be approved in the US by, by year end or early next year and, and then to follow in Canada, um, I guess as, as soon as 2023. And if we just look at anticipated outcomes for carcinoma in situ, um, you know, what does it actually mean? So 80%, I said already, will have a response to BCG, but up to 40% will recur again within five years. Some of those patients will get more BCG or different treatment options. The risk of progression of treated CIS is 15% at five years. Untreated, it can be 50% at five years. And approximately 15% will have a cystectomy within five years, although that is very subjective. Some people are reluctant to do cystectomy, some are more likely to do cystectomy. So it, it's it's variable, but I think the, the bottom line is it is it is a serious entity. We, we have to treat it aggressively to avoid progression and hopefully to preserve bladder in those that we can, but in some, when they need it, we really have to do it in a timely fashion. Um, I'm gonna skip over that again here so we have some time for questions. So this is my, my final slide, just to, to highlight some of the, the main points. Carcinoma in situ is potentially threatening. It's unpredictable in patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. In patients who have muscle invasive bladder cancer, it doesn't have nearly as much uh, impact. It's not, not that critical. Um, it is cancer. You know, the in situ implies that it's some precursor, but it is cancer. It needs to be treated optimally to eradicate it and prevent progression. Um, it needs to be monitored closely. And there are a lot of new treatments on the horizon that should be should increase our rate of, of preserving bladders. And I will end there and, and open it up to questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Black. It's very interesting how CIS is an early stage of bladder cancer, but still high risk and really needs that specific um, and aggressive treatment. So thank you for uh, the great overview. So we'll open up the floor to questions. So I'll start by reading one out. Um, we have uh, a question from Jane. She says, is CIS in the bladder and ureter detected by a CT scan? Um, yeah, so it's a good question. Uh, and the answer is no. Um, because it's flat, it is not seen on scans. So, um, CIS of the ureter is particularly tricky uh, because you cannot do cis view in the ureter. You will not see it typically on your ureteroscopy. And all you'll have to go by is a cytology that shows cancer cells coming from that side. You know, when you take urine from say the left ureter and kidney, um, that's where the cancer cells are and you don't see anything. So that, that by itself defines CIS and you can treat it as CIS. In the bladder, you will always be able to do a biopsy and, and get tissue, um, but you won't see it on CT scan. And then another one, for, this one's from Joe. Um, why is it that CIS, which is initially staying above the basal layer, progresses to connective tissue and muscle tissue? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, you know, why does, why does any cancer uh, turn into cancer? I think that, you know, carcinoma in situ has accumulated... Um, some changes, but not yet the ability to invade and, and something switches in it, uh, you know, new mutations or whatever genomic alterations that allow it to invade. So we think that all bladder tumor uh, starts with something like carcinoma in situ. We just don't necessarily diagnose the carcinoma in situ. And then it learns how to invade and, and goes through the basement membrane into the deeper layers. Um, and we have Jackie who would like to ask a question live. Oh, hi. Hi, Dr. Hi. Bray, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. I'm just curious. I saw CIS find S Roger report, but my brother is out. And I safe now. Sorry, you're you're echoing a lot, Jackie. Okay. I think I think I I think I got the, the gist. The gist okay. of the question is, 
you're not going to get carcinoma in situ uh, in your bladder if your bladder's out. <laughs> so that that is yes. definitive. <laughs> the um, but but the one the, again one of the you know tricky things about carcinoma in situ is that if you have it in multiple places in the bladder, you're at risk for having it. In, in men in the urethra, in men and women also in the ureters and kidneys. So it's not a high risk, but it's something that you need to still be monitored for. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, another question um, uh, from Kelly. Is it possible for chirps or biopsies to see CIS? You know, in, in principle, we do worry about um, seeding cancer cells from one spot to another uh, when we're doing a TRBT. Um, so one of the you know ways that a bladder cancer can recur in, in theory, no one's ever shown that it actually happens, is if if we're scraping away the tumor and, and the tumor fragments are floating in the bladder, that it attaches somewhere else and turns into a tumor. I think, you know, it happens with low grade, it happens to high grade. It, for low grade, it seems pretty unlikely that, that, that they would have the ability to latch on somewhere and grow. For carcinoma, carcinoma in situ, I think it's, it's not really an issue um, because these are, are flat cells that like to detach anyway. They're floating around in the urine um, all the time. So I don't expect them to, to seed anywhere. And, and, you know, if it did, it would be more carcinoma in situ. But, yeah, so I don't think it happens with carcinoma in situ. Um, another question from Joe. Blue light cystoscopy requires a special cystoscopy manufactured by stores and the cost seems to be prohibiting local hospitals to acquire them. My understanding is that many hospitals in Canada are equipped with Olympus cystoscopy, which has narrow band imaging option. Is there any attempt to make blue light available for Olympus cystoscopy so it will be available to more patients? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's more than just Storts and Olympus, so we don't uh, want to get hung up on on companies. Um, but currently, the blue light is dependent on a hospital having the uh, the appropriate system, and uh, you know, to replace the equipment costs is about a hundred thousand dollars, <throat> and and typically hospitals will be quite willing to invest that, um, or foundations will. Um, but it's actually the ongoing costs for each dose of, of the CISVU that are the real problem. Um, and, and that's where the battle is. And right now it's not funded by anybody. It's just up to the hospital to decide on a, on a um, one by one basis, whether they want to pay for it or not. And anytime you have a new treatment like this, that is dependent on physicians championing it at their own hospital. I mean, they're, any given doctor has a lot of responsibilities and is pulled in a lot of different directions. And, you know, some of them are maybe not, don't do that much bladder cancer. It's, it's really quite an ask that it's dependent on the physicians to make it happen. And um, there has been, there was a, a health technology assessment done in BC. There's also one in Ontario um, that both show. So these are, are things where the, where the government says, okay, we want to do an analysis to see if this is cost effective. If we look at the outcomes for patients, the quality of life for patients and the cost of the treatment, is it cost effective? And both of those and HTAs say that it is cost effective, which I think should motivate the provincial payers to cover this um, because they're basically saying it's, you know, it's going to save money in the end. Uh, we're not there yet, but I would I'd love to see uh, Bladder Cancer Canada kind of championing that because I think it is uh, it is important for patients. Totally. I guess Joe's so part of Joe's question is will it ever be available for for non storts equipment and and the answer to that is yes people are looking are are developing the technology to make it independent of storts. Okay, great, thank you. Um... With BCG, do you still recommend moving around for the first hour to ro rolling around every 15 minutes to hit every possible um, CIS surfaces? Um, so I have never recommended that. <laughs> do, do you still is funny. So yeah, no, that's old dogma, makes no sense. Um, the bladder, I know it's still done widely, but I, I would love to see that eradicated <laughs> from practice. Um, the bladder, when the bladder is empty, it is completely collapsed. So the bladder walls are like touching each other. 
And if you put BCG or any other drug in there, it, it will have contact. Uh, yeah, the other particular thing with BCG is that it's it's an immunotherapy. It doesn't necessarily have to get to every cell. It, it uh, will trigger an immune response. So bottom line is no rolling around. Okay, great. And uh, we'll get to one more question. We're getting um, tight for time. So someone, uh, Vivian is asking, um, when you say CIS is sometimes invisible, do you mean that it doesn't even show up when using CITFU and blue light? Well, I was I was referring particularly to um, white light, so we don't we often don't see it on white light. Um, but yes, with blue light, with blue light, you'll see more, um, but you won't necessarily see everything. It's not one hundred percent. Okay. Well, if you have any other questions, um, please feel free to email um, info at bladdercancercanada.org, and we can um, hopefully get some more answers to you. So um, thank you again, Dr. Black, and thank you everyone for attending. I think this was um, really informative and provided a lot of insight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody.